and uh, thanks for hanging in there with us. Uh, well, we have quite a bit of content uh, scheduled for an hour, so uh, we each targeted about 20 minutes and then allowed 20 minutes for questions at the end. So, watching the clock, we'll, we'll do the best we can here. Um, so, just a little bit of background. Uh, this has been a total of a, probably about a 13 year journey. Uh, not all of it was open innovation, part of it was preparation. Uh, Lynn mentioned we had a big budget cut in 2005. Uh, Elizabeth put together a, a visioning exercise for us, and that helped us write a strategy that led us to be open, open to new ideas. Op we, we did not know about open innovation yet, but we were open to forming alliances and how might we do work differently. So I had the opportunity to take Elcor, a leading change in organizational renewal, from Mike Teshman and Charles O'Reilly back in 2008, and that's where I met Kareem. Um, I asked one question in class. I said, uh, could, I, could I found a new air quality monitor uh, on Innocentive? Because he was teaching the Innocentive case, and he said, yeah, I don't know why not. So off we went. Um, and you know, within about 18 months, we've done our pilots uh, after that. So the first thing we did, just to kind of tie back to this morning, is uh, Kareem came down and taught the Threadless case to about 250 R&D folks with no preparation. So we didn't say, tie this to your work. We just wanted to teach the case and see how it went. And uh, it, you know, it was mixed, <laughs> but uh, it introduced the topic of open innovation without automatically saying, we're going to do this, and we're going to uh, expect you guys to do this. But it got the topic out there. It got people talking about it. And a few people bought t-shirts, so that was a good thing. So, <laughs> um, so I will, I, I'm going to talk about process type things and the structure. Elizabeth's going to talk about the cultural barriers. So the two takeaways to accelerate, so what we're going to talk about is our timeline, but how you go faster, in, in our opinion. So just some recommendations about organizationally, how could you go faster? And so the two takeaways are prepare for success. I mean, that sounds kind of funny, but I'll tell you why that's important. You have to anticipate these are going to work, and it's going to be part of your toolkit as you go forward. And you have to anticipate the barrier. So if you anticipate, plan for a lot of these things that are going to happen, you think you can go faster. Um, let's see. The slides. Hello? No, not that one, Jeff. This one? The little one? Uh, down is too advanced. Down. Okay, good. Um, so I'll touch on this slide for just a bit. So in retrospect, we did not conduct the, the process in this manner. It was one long experiment. So that's why it's in the seven to eight year range. But we look backward at our experience and say, what phases do these fall into? How, how did this really occur? And our initial cut at this was learn, experiment, scale, and sustain. And since Elizabeth and I have both left NASA and our organizations are out consulting, and being former NASA folks, that acronym spelled less. And we thought, that's probably not a great uh, acronym. So now it's learn, pilot, scale, and sustain. Um, so we'll tell you about these phases as we go forward. So in the learn phase, just real quickly, what our organization looked like? A thousand people, high uh, technical workforce, uh, MDs, physicians, engineers, have a heavy R&D component, and we uh, set, set out to acquire the information we needed. So, you know, Threadless case, uh, we began, began to read um, about all the possible opportunities we had at that time. Um, in the pilot phase, we went very quickly into the pilot phase. So we started in 2009, and there was an amazing confluence of events. So um, uh, the uh, federal government was standing up challenge.gov, through OSTP, we were running our pilots, and a lot of people were doing case cases at that time. So that was a nice coming together. So very quickly, in about uh, from late early 2009 till late 2010, so about eight, 20 months or so, we ran 14 external challenges and 20 internal challenges, which was uh, an effort <laughs> since we were all pretty new at this at this point. Um, we did seven on Innocentive, uh, six on Yet2.com, and one on Top Coder through Kareem. Um, and that was our external experience. And then we did 20 uh, internal on the platform called NASA at Work. And we gave two to each of the 10 centers because we wanted to have each of the 10 centers gain experience through uh, trying this. And the takeaway from that is we think you should do internal first and then external because it will 
socialize the idea of open innovation without uh, starting to push all those fears out about you're trying to outsource me and um, you're trying to replace us. Um, scaling, yeah, so we, the uh, OSCP asked us to stand up the center of excellence. That was kind of a nice push, actually. I don't know if we would have been kind of ready for that at that moment. Um, and we said, okay. And the, the okay part was also for all the federal government. So it wasn't just for NASA. And I won't even <clears throat> touch on that now because Lynn and Steve and Chris and Jeff can fill you in on the to totality of the number of challenges that are now being run. Uh, and for all the different federal agencies, you heard a little bit about that this morning. And finally, sustain phase, which uh, is keeping it going. And so we thought you needed a tool to help people learn about that. That was the solution guide. And I'll, I'll touch on that briefly in a little bit. OK, so I think I touched on most of these. I'm going to skip some of these slides because we will be short on time today. Um, and I really kind of said this in the introduction. And I think the slides are going to be available for folks, or yes, no, yeah, okay. Um, this was the time course, roughly about seven to eight years, and I'll have a comparative slide at the end. We think you can shrink that by half, you know, if, if you plan for all these different phases. So um, very quickly, because you heard about learning and um, pilots this morning, these are some recommendations for us, and I'll preface it with saying that, as Jen mentioned, we're, we're writing a paper to highlight all this. So the paper will be coming out to, to put guidelines down and recommendations of how you can go faster organizationally to put this in place. So to accelerate the learning phase, in addition to <coughs> coming to a class like this and reading, because uh, there's lots of material out there now, uh, a lot of things can be conducted in parallel. So if you're ready for it, you can, instead of doing it sequentially like we did, you can do these in parallel. Uh, an innovation plan that's aligned with your innovation strategy would be ideal. Show how the innovation efforts are going to actually tie to your business strategy. Senior management value proposition, you're going to have to sell this. You need funds for the pilot project. Um, identify the open innovation platforms. What are you going to use and why you know, to get started? Um, portfolio analysis, I think this is really key. So very quickly, we had 30 human system risks that we managed for spaceflight, bone loss, muscle loss, radiation exposure, things like that. We broke those down into their component parts and said, where don't we have a solution? Where do we have a gap? Where do we have a problem we need to solve? And that was very important to focus those initial problems. So they were high priority. And if we got a result, it was going to be significant. Engage your business functions early. We had to get legal and procurement on board. Um, and then a plan to implement the solutions. So this was the uh, pilot phase, how to accelerate. Um, again, go ahead and get the platforms, procure the platforms. Um, we went to the effort of training the workforce to conduct the challenges uh, because this was all new. So uh, we had training about how do you do open innovation, why does it work, the social theory of it. This is back in 2009. We had champions for each of the challenges. So we had a technical expert who was the champion that owned the challenge, which was solar flare, uh, exercise challenge, food packaging challenge. Uh, set expectations for management. <clears throat> Why that's important is the perception was you're giving a prize, like Kareem showed this morning, you know, the Ortec prize and those things. And we got pushback saying, oh, you didn't get a complete solution. Well, we never intended to. I mean, if we're way down here at a low uh, technology level, we wanted to advance the ball, which is equally important, but we didn't say that expressly. And so I think setting management's expectation of what do you think you're going to get back for this prize is really important. And then we already mentioned internal first and external because your folks will get used to running open innovation. They'll learn the platforms, and you haven't yet got into this threat scenario of you know you, you might be trying to outsource them. So why scale after the pilot phase? I like these quotes. Um, just every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. So if you're trying to change your system. Um, that's We were trying to change our business model. And that, in, in an effect, change, it has to change the culture because you're going to drive uh, a new approach. Um, this is another knowledge is widely dispersed. I just like this slide because there's something like 35,000 publications represented in those dots. This is uh, some of Kareem's early students um, who were MD, MBAs, came down. 
and looked at how might we organizationally do this. Um, there are 10 green dots in there that uh, represent 10 major medical centers who were really well connected together, but there's 35,000 publications. So I liked it as a visual graphic because if you're looking for the long tail, I mean, how do you know if you don't look? And so, um, you know, if you're only depending on those two, three, four centers that you know that you already work with, you may not be looking out at the long tail. Um, and what immediately popped out to us for the pilots, we were getting new ideas from all over the world. We we're getting a global response. Uh, people we'd never worked with, uh, it was fast. You know, it was a few weeks by the time you designed a challenge and posted it. More or less on demand. I mean, once we had the money to run the pilots, we didn't have to wait for a funding cycle. You weren't having to wait till October, or, you know, whenever your funding cycle was to go do new work and much lower cost. I mean, most of our challenges were $20,000, $30,000 prizes. So uh, not these huge, you know, million dollar centennial prizes. Um, again, why scale after the pilot phase? We added to our organizational skills. So in order to pull this off, we, had, we added folks. We added uh, a number of folks with MBAs. Uh, Elizabeth headed up a group first called uh, Strategy Execution. Uh, and implementation, and that that whole idea of having a separate group morphed into the center of excellence because we realized we couldn't get it done through line management. We were trying to get line management to do both the day-to-day -day, uh, planning for operations and to try to change and change the business model. Very tough. So when Mike talks about being ambidextrous, absolutely true. We needed to split those functions out. Um, we added business functions and just kind of looking back, you know, who were the folks that came in? They were open to new change and new approaches. I call it being okay with ambiguity because there was no playbook for this. There was no plan. <laughs> there was no manual. Um, this was all new. It was very, it was organizationally created because we were trying a new way to, to do business. Um, they were self-initiators. And, and then we got additional skills by interacting with the platforms. So we got a lot of help in how to write a good problem statement. Um, how, how do you abstract that problem statement so you get more people looking at the problem across different disciplines? So lots of reasons for um, uh, adding to your skill mix. And then finally, you can focus. So you can, by forming the center of excellence, you can organize your approach, focus your approach, um, as Lynn and Stephen and others talked about today, there are now 10 platforms uh, through the NASA Tournament Lab, and uh, it allows uh, that function to go very smoothly, interface with the line organization, if you will, the, you know, the product organization, and then hopefully serve as a resource to get more and more people to, to run challenges um, and to put that in place as a tool, which I'll talk about towards the end. So what was the process for us? Our scaling timeline, it, you know, it's hard to draw an exact a line. It was roughly about 27 months. A lot of that was because it was a serial function. Um, we first kicked it off with a peer leadership team meeting. So uh, Karine came down for trip number three um, to help us with that workshop. And um, what came out of that was folks said, well, we get it, but give us a checklist. Uh, and we said, well, a checklist is a little too narrow, we'll build you a set of guidelines, and that's what led to the solution mechanism bed. And then we had to have follow-on contracts. So when I said prepare to succeed, our first set of contracts were for the pilots only. And then, again, we were learning. We had no idea if this was going to work or not. And once it worked, we said we have to continue this. And the only way we can train our workforce is to have the contracts in place so that they can use the tools because otherwise we'll just frustrate people if we say, you know, go look at this website and think about running a challenge. And again, we did, we repeated and brought the capabilities back to have both internal and external crowdsource. Um, we established the Center of Excellence in 2011, um, recruited staff, and then, uh, began to build the solution back guide, which was a comparative decision tool to let people compare prizes and contests with grants, contracts, and other tools. Um, NASA at Work was already talked about today. This, uh, we got this established in 2012. 
Uh, Steve mentioned, I think, this morning, they had both technical and non-technical challenges. Um, users gained familiarity with open innovation platforms, and they had developed their own reward system. So we initially were able to give small cash awards, and then we were not able to do that, so the crowd actually came back and told us what would be important for them, like a cool NASA experience, like you go get to ride the NASA rover, um, you know, visit a center, visit some, you know, something that they don't usually get to do. And so, again, intrinsic rewards. So this was important to people that, to be able to do that. And I think with this slide, I'm done. I'll turn it over to Elizabeth. So the one I want to point, on, point out on here is as COSI has grown in the scale and sustain phase, they touch many different disciplines. It's not just life sciences. Um, the competitions were effectively combined with other tools. I think there's a lot of value to saying you can have a competition um, before you put out a grant or contract. And the first public-private prize is scheduled uh, for this fall, I think, right? So, yeah. with the Rock, sorry, finalists will be selected uh, with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. So this was the first use of America Competes, which allows uh, public-private. Um, efforts to come up with a, a prize. Uh, this is on air quality. So a uh, lot of uh, uh, work in uh, 10 or 15 minutes here. So I'm going to turn it over to Elizabeth so we can have time for questions. OK, so Jeff talked about the process and the infrastructure that's associated with um, scaling and using the center of excellence to do that. And I'm going to talk about overcoming cultural barriers in both the scaling and sustaining phases of the design. And I'm sure before everybody walked into this room, everybody, most of you at least, know that when you introduce a new way of doing business to your organization, you're going to face a lot of resistance. And we have heard from various talks today and, and discussions and cases that that has, has been the case. Um, and that can range from just discomfort or skepticism to outright fear and anger. And we experienced all of that. Um, So um, just to set the stage, Jeff told you about the organization. It's, it's about 1,000 people. They are scientists, engineers, physicists, uh, uh, physicians. And their job is to keep astronauts healthy and, and um, alive in space. Um, that they're highly structured work processes. Most of the, um, the reward systems at that point were individual or internal team-based. Um, NASA most, was doing some collaborating, but it was mostly with contractors or the same old institutions um, traditionally. And, um, and in, in all of those cases, NASA technical experts were, were the innovators. And that's why they came to NASA, because they were innovators. So that's what the culture is like. Um, and then we imposed open innovation on them. And we knew that cultural issues would be an obstacle, because Kareem told us that this would happen. So we came up with a communications plan from the start. We, we, we designed it during the pilot phase, and we started executing it then, and really started rolling it out during the scaling phase. And we did it both from the top down and the bottom up. We conducted some of the workshops that Jeff mentioned early on, and we established a, um, an innovation um, lecture series where we brought in people from external organizations who had successfully implemented some form of open innovation in their organizations on a quarterly basis. We um, had lots of uh, emails and, and organizational briefings from, from the director, Jeff. And we also tried some bottom-up stuff. Um, we had identified the OI champions. He told you about that. And we tried to use them to, to uh, insert some enthusiasm on the process. And we had this workshop at the end of the very successful pilot phase. And it was a peer-to-peer -peer workshop um, where each of the seven, there were seven, I think, at the time, pilot um, challenge owners were seated at a panel, and they presented all of the great successful work that they, they had done. And all along the way with this communications, we felt like we were having to push people. You know, people didn't necessarily want to go to the innovation lecture series. They didn't. Um, they thought maybe open innovation was a fad and that it would go away. But the workshop is really what kind of kicked us into gear because that was where people exhibited real skepticism and, and anger. And that is the, the forum that Jeff mentioned. Um, we had reactions like someone standing up saying this was all a ploy to outsource um, them. Somebody else said, um, 
that they, even though this is a tool, when it was, it, we hadn't quite gotten to that language yet, even though we understood it to be a tool for them to use to accelerate some of their things, they said, well, we need more money, we need more time, we need a, a new budget line to charge our time because we don't have time to do this innovation stuff, which is not what we expected. And even more so, we heard comments like, we are NASA, we innovate. We know space flight, nobody else does. We're the ones that can do this, nobody else can. And that really resonated um, with us. <coughs> kind of went back and regrouped and said, okay, how, how could they look at all of these successful outcomes and have that reaction? And we kind of came to the understanding that in all of the communications we did, and this came up earlier, um, someone down here, mentioned it, we had never said how critical the technical experts were to, to the, whole, the whole process. Because after all, they, they're the ones that have to do the gaps analysis and the portfolio analysis. They have to define the problems, which is critical to a successful outcome. They need to evaluate the solutions, and ultimately they need to implement them in, in some way. Um, so we, we, we kind of realized that that was a mistake on our part. What we didn't realize, but what Gila helped us realize, was that some of these other comments were really based on the professional identity um, situation. And that we should have been recognizing these challenge owners as solution finders, but they were still viewing themselves as problem solvers. And really, they weren't getting much recognition at all and they were doing all that stuff in, in, in this slide, but it was all being done in the background. People that weren't actively engaged in the pilot process didn't realize that that was even going on. And instead, what was happening was, uh, and you've seen the slide already, um, Mike Cushman presented it, the, the, the entities that were being glorified were the platforms themselves and the problem solvers in the community of the platform. And so while you had these scientists that were critical to, and to everything, they were in the background and the guy with the cap was in the foreground. And so it's kind of, and it's kind of the opposite situation that um, Balaji was talking about earlier because he said we should tell more stories about why um, uh, these problem solvers are heroes and, and it will help the whole pro uh, crowdsourcing initiative generally. And I, I agree with that. But you also, externally, but internally, you've got to recognize the guys who are behind it all. And that is what we weren't going to do. So, so why? So again, this is from, from Gila's work. She conducted a three-year um, field study on our organization. And she was looking at opportunities and challenges, um, specifically in our research and development organization. And what she helped us understand is that while the management focus and attention was on efficiency and success of the model, and it really was efficient and successful, the scientists um, considered it very threatening because they did not want to identify the things they couldn't solve and then throw them out to an anonymous crowd and have them come back with a solution that, that they couldn't um, come up with um, or, a, or an advancement in the technology. And so it was a real threat to their professional identity. Um, they wanted to be, like I said earlier, they wanted to be the problem solvers. That's why they were there. Um, it was rooted in their identity, um, their, in their education, in their professional training, and in all of the reward systems. It was based on things like publications and, and uh, et cetera. And so we completely missed this. And um, uh, this also, I was reminded of this when um, Kareem stepped through the, the threadless case this morning and we <coughs> talked about the motivators. These guys are in, intrinsically motivated. They would not have been at NASA if they wanted to be making a lot of money. They would have gone to a corporate um, setting. They were there because they wanted to, to do the next moon landing, essentially. So, um, what I wanted to point out here is that this, this situation is not unique to NASA or government organizations. It happens in all organizations, and particularly in research and development organizations. And there are several studies that came up with the same um, conclusions that, that we came up with, with with a benchmark and with our experience. Um, PwC just recently did an innovation benchmark with 1,200 executives in 44 countries. Um, University of Cambridge 
um, did an innovation study um, 10 years ago or so of 36 firms and in six industries, all, all corporate. And they all arrived, and these are just a couple studies that um, I read. They all arrived at the same conclusions, that culture change is a key factor for innovation success. In both in terms of being an enabler, if you create the right culture, you can enable more successful open innovation, and an obstacle. If you ignore the culture, it can be a real obstacle. Other enablers are um, senior management support. You have to have um, top-down support. Um, some of the studies also um, mentioned middle management support, and I think that's just as important, and it certainly was at NASA. Um, if, even if you have abundant senior management support, which you need, it can stop right here, and the people that got to implement it can't do it if you don't have that middle management support as well. And then these studies also um, uh, recommended as an innovation success factor to establish formal structures to manage the innovation process. And in our case, it was the COSI, and that is what we are recommending as a way of organizing and managing innovation within your organization. Um, the other thing that you need to think about um, when you're looking at your organization <laughs> is that the attitudes to open innovation differ across various functions. So we were only research and development. And research and development um, is generally the function that is tasked with implementing open innovation. Um, other functions like um, blue sky research or corporate ventures or accelerators, those sorts of things are already, they're inherently open. So there's not, you're not going to encounter as much resistance in those organizations as you are in R&D. And so as you think about how to communicate um, your messages, you need to take into consideration the various functions and what's going to resonate with each. And don't forget any of them. So um, in addition to the loss of identity as a problem solver, which is a big um, cause of the not invented here syndrome or, or resistance to external innovation, there are some other things that can factor into that. It can just be a fear of failure um, if, you're, if you have a, a risk-averse organization. Um, if your incentive systems I mentioned earlier are only aimed at individual contributors, um, that's not going to encourage people to go out and work with other people or, or the crowd. Um, and then there's just generally people get nervous if they don't understand what's going on. If there's a lack of familiarity with the system, or they can just be suspicious of, of stuff that they don't understand. So how do you combat this? Well, like Jeff said, you start with, with clear innovation strategy that's aligned with your business strategy and goals and objectives. And you keep with it, and you use that to drive all of your activities um, that you engage in to scale your innovation and then later to sustain it. Um, there, you, you, it's really important to establish some OI champions. They help nurture a culture of innovation. It's more peer-to-peer -peer or even bottom-up. And um, they tend to be enthusiastic. So if you get those guys on board, that'll got guys and girls, guys being generic, uh, that really help you a, a lot. Also, I, I mentioned that we knew up, up from the start that we needed to communicate to address this cultural failure. But we didn't quite do it right. So yes, you need to communicate. You need to communicate over and over again. But what you need to make sure is you're communicating the right message. So again, you need to get that message aimed at your particular organization and your particular organizational culture. So if you can try to shift it to be more collaborative. Um, and you need to put um, reward and recognition um, programs in place and provide the necessary tools um, and processes to facilitate it. And all of that will help advance your culture and combat non-invented here syndrome. So to, in, in summary of the scaling phase, to accelerate it, this includes what both Jeff and I talked about. You establish a center of excellence. You, you, you put it together um, to organize and, and to manage the innovation. You recruit multiple business units. And this should start in the pilot phase, even the learning if you can. By the time you're accelerating, you should have um, uh, your legal team, HR, and procurement on board so that, like Jeff pointed out earlier, you're ready to move. You're, if you're if you're having to wait and explain what all this is while you're trying to accelerate across the organization, you're not going to be able to move very quickly. Um, assess and, of course, assess and address cultural issues. And um, again, the implementation plan. So once you've scaled innovation, how do you, how do you keep it going? How do you sustain that in your organization? 
Well, in NASA's case, um, the, the COSI was established, and in addition, and, and the infrastructure was, it was expanded. And I'm not going to talk about that because Jim already did. The factors that are, are um, that, that, are, that the COSI is responsible for in terms of cultural things are evangelizing. That means going across all the 10 NASA centers, Steve being the king of evangelism over there. I think Chris has been doing it too. Um, and uh, you tell them what this is and why it benefits them and what COSI has to offer. And then mentoring, mentoring the OI champions and the technical experts in, in all of the aspects of the process. And, and again, recognizing them. Your center of excellence can work with um, other functions in the organization, whether it be HR or somebody else, um, to, to communicate across the organization that these, these people are doing this good stuff. And um, as a result,